Jesus. Good evening. Welcome to the David Stenbaugh Show. Tonight we're going to be looking at, <clears throat> let me get my papers in order here. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 40, verses 16 through 30, and then verse 34, and then verse 38. We, are been, we have been looking at first things, and this is the beginning of the tabernacle. A continuation of the first freedom. This is going to be the last in the series of first things. Next week we're going to be looking, begin to look at the, at the Jesus and the just reign of God. <clears throat> Ancient Israel's tabernacle can be thought of as a portable temple. Exodus 40 is a conclusion to all the instructions regarding the tabernacle proper and how it was built, we may call these multi-chapter sections the two narratives of the tabernacle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exodus chapter 40 verses 1 through 11 parallels the instruction narrative of, of Exodus, <clears throat> excuse me again, of Exodus uh, 35 through 39. Exodus 40, verses 12 through 15, is not exactly a parallel. It deals with Aaron, that's Moses' brother, and his sons, and about whom details are given in Exodus chapters 28 and 29 and Leviticus chapter 8. The golden calf story of Exodus chapters 32 through 34 has been placed between the two narratives of the tabernacle. Knowing the reason for this deliberate placement helps us appreciate more fully the tabernacle's purpose. Moses' delay on the mountain in Exodus chapter 32 verse 1 resulted in the Israelites becoming anxious, so they expressed to Aaron a desire to have a visible representation of deity or gods. Previously the people had been very afraid even to listen to God lest they die. And they had implored Moses to intercede. We see that in Exodus 20, verses 18 through 20, and again in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 23 through 27. What the people demanded of Aaron was a material, visible entity to substitute for Moses' intercession between them and the presence of the invisible God. Exodus chapter 32 through 34, therefore, represents false work false worship as God was, in effect, put back into the nature and form of a calf. By contrast, the tabernacle and its furnishings represent true worship where God's presence was rightly displayed. And that brings us up to our text. I am reading from the King James Version. So if you have your Bible handy, 
Why don't you grab it and turn with me there to Exodus chapter 40, beginning in verse 16. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle, and fastened his sockets, and set up the boards thereof, and put in the bars thereof, and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put up the table in the tent of the congregation, upon the side of the tabernacle, northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle, and he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered it upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and put water there to wash withal. Now we come to verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now we come down to verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Constructing the tabernacle. Verse 16. The obedience of Moses. Thus Mo Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him. So did he. At the beginning of the instructions, God had said to Moses, Let them make, a, let, let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, so even so shall he make it. That's Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. Moses is to ensure that the tabernacle furnishings are made according to the instructions given to him on Mount Sinai. Moses also is to erect the tabernacle according to God's specifications. The work itself is done primarily by many skilled workers, but Moses is in charge of making sure that everything is done right. By the time we reach the verse before us, the phrase, all that the Lord commanded him, so did he, or a variation of it, has been repeated numerous times with regard to the tabernacle's construction. It will be repeated several more times between here and the end of the book. Moses is meticulous in his obedience. What do you think? What do you think? What are some benefits of complete obedience to God? What may be the cost of such obedience? And I want you to look up these verses. Matthew chapter 19, verses 29 through 27 through 29. John chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 29. And then verses 40 and 41. And James chapter 1, verse 25. I want you to look those up on your own and see if you can answer the question of what are some benefits of complete obedience to God. What may be the cost of such obedience? Most of us have a stubborn streak. We like to do things a certain way, and we also prefer that others do things the way we want them done. Frank Sinatra's famous song, My Way, echoes this kind of stubborn individualism. Sometimes the My Way approach involves whole communities. For example, residents of the small village of Townline, New York, voted in 1861 to secede from the Union. 
reportedly on a vote of 85 to 40. The village didn't officially end its break with the union until a new vote was taken on January 24th, 1946. Doing it my way may mean having blinders on regarding the wisdom of a different course of action. It may mean ignoring the likely consequences of stubbornly push, pushing ahead when circumstances suggest that we would be wise to reconsider our position. If we're not careful, our stubbornness may lead us into the trap of convincing ourselves that our way must be God's way. This seems to have been the problem of Jesus' opponents during his ministry on earth. Do we ever repeat this same error? We now come to verse 17, the date of completion. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. The second year is a reference to the beginning of the exodus from Egypt. The Israelites had arrived in the wilderness of Sinai in the third month, the same day, after their departure. Therefore, the people have been in this area for ten months by the time the tabernacle is finished. The raising of the tabernacle on the one-year anniversary of the exodus reinforces the idea that the Israelites are a distinct people. What a New Year's Day! Now we come to verse 18, the structure of the sanctuary. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. The statement, Moses reared up the tabernacle, refers to the tabernacle proper, that is, the walls. For each item listed in the verse before us, we will note references both to the instruction about it and to its construction. The foundation of the tabernacle consists of a hundred sockets. There are forty for the north and south walls each. There are fourteen for the west side and two additional corner sockets to make a total of sixteen there. The remaining four are used for the pillars that, are dust, that we're about to discuss. Placed in the sockets are forty-eight gold-covered boards made of shittim. That's acacia wood. Each measures 10 cubits high by one and a half cubits wide. There are 20 boards on the north, 20 on the south, 6 on the west, and 2 corner ones. There are 4 gold covered bars to hold the boards in place. The middle bar apparently goes through the boards themselves for extra stability, separating the most holy place, that's the holy of holies, from the holy place as a veil that hangs on 4 gold covered pillars. We note five more pillars used for the entrance to the tabernacle. We now come to verse 19. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. The tent over the tabernacle and the covering of the tent consist of numerous curtains. These are made from layers of cloth and skin. There are many artist sketches of what these coverings may have looked like. Now we come to furnishing the tabernacle. Verse 20, the Holy of Holies. And he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves on the ark and, and, put, the mercy, and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. The ark of the testimony is the focal point of the tabernacle because it is the exact location for God's presence and, re, and revelation for Moses and the high priest. The special feature of the ark's covering is two cherubims molded of pure gold. The cherubims have wings that meet each other and their faces look down on the mercy seat, the place where God will meet with Moses. The Israelites will come to envision the mercy seat to be God's footstool, the place of his feet, while his throne is in heaven itself. God establishes the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat for forgiveness of sins. We see that in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 through 16. This foreshadows what Christ does for us. We see that in Hebrews chapter 9 and in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. The testimony that is put into the ark refers to the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Other things will be put in later. The staves are used for carrying the ark, since to touch the ark itself is to invite death. We see that in Exodus chapter 37, verses 4 and 5, and again in Exodus chapter 25, 
verses 14 through 16, and again in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. We now come to verse 21. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. The beautifully crafted veil of the covering is hung on four wooden pillars that are overlaid with gold and placed in silver sockets. This veil is designed to conceal the ark of the testimony, the ark of the testimony, later known more commonly as the ark of the covenant, per Numbers chapter ten. Verse 33, from the priest, only once a year will the high priest be allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Jesus' death and atonement for our sins has enabled every believer to enter into God's presence today. The veil has been torn asunder. What do you think? Thinking of the veil or curtain that Christ tore down in Mark 15:38, how can we Ensure that we do not put up veils that may hinder relationships, ours or others, with God. What about the veils of wrong priorities, the veils of traditions, and the veils of legalism? Think about it. Now we come to the tent of meeting. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. The table in the tent of the congregation, located on the north side of the holy place, is primarily for the showbread. This consists of twelve cakes made of fine flour, each cake representing a tribe. That is the reference of the set the bread in order. The bread represents God's provision in the wilderness. It is to re be replaced every Sabbath with fresh, with fresh bread. Only priests are allowed to eat this bread and only in the holy place. The table also includes utensils for wine and drink offerings. We now come to verses 24 and 25. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. The candlestick is made from a solid piece of gold. It is hammered out so that the candlestick rises from a base to form a metal stem with three branches on each side, molded as a flowering almond tree. Thus there are seven oil-filled bulls that provide light in the tabernacle. The candlestick is probably about three and a half feet tall. There is a depiction of it carved into the Ark of Triumph in Rome. The carving depicts the successful conclusion of the siege of Jerusalem by Titus Flavius in A.D. 70. The candlestick is located on the south side opposite the table of the showbread. What do you think? What do you think? What do you need to do to make sure that Christ continues to be the candlestick or lamp that lights your way? I have some more scripture I want you to look up on your own. I want you to look these up on your own because I want you to read the Bible. Look at Psalm 119 verses 105, 1 John, 1, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, and Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. Now we come to verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> and he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil, and he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. The golden altar is for burning incense. It is not to be used for burnt offerings. It is placed before the veil, behind which stands the Ark of the Covenant. The aroma of sweet incense wafts into the Holy of Holies to, rep to represent the prayers of the people rising into God's presence. Once per year, the high priest anoints the horns of this altar with blood for the atonement of the people. This altar is part of the setting of Gabriel's appearance to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1. We now come to verse 28. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle. The curtain at the door of the tabernacle is similar in construction to the inner veil. This curtain 
hangs on five golden pillars, but unlike the four pillars for the veil set in silver sockets, the sockets for this entrance curtain are covered with brass. This is probably because they can be seen from outside and so are considered part of the brass items in the courtyard. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? What does the quality and particularity of the tabernacle furnishings have to say about how we should furnish church buildings, if anything? What about the cost versus the value? What about the phrase, the best is the enemy of good enough? I want you to look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 8 through 13. We now come to verse 29, the courtyard. And he put the altar of burnt offering <clears throat> by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offerings as the Lord commanded Moses. The altar of burnt offering is sometimes called the brazen altar. The sacrifices to be placed on it are described in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 38. The horns of this altar <clears throat> are sacred, and sinners can flee to them to avoid punishment. Others will flee to these horns in hopes of forgiveness or compassion from earthly enemies. This altar foreshadows Christ, who is our perfect sacrifice and the altar for our redemption. We now come to verse 30. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and put water there to wash withal. The laver is a large bowl with a stand, both of brass. These are made from the looking glasses of the women assembling at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. These brass mirrors, highly polished and beautiful, were probably procured from the Egyptians during the Exodus. The priests have to be clean each time they enter the tabernacle or offer sacrifices, so this laver is for washing in that regard. The penalty for priests not washing their feet and hands is death. We see that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 20 and 21. So the altar and laver go together. We could compare these verses with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, and Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Church building programs can be exciting experiences. Ideally, the process will unite the congregation in joyfully completing the task. But some congregations find the process to be a source of strife. In one church, the men on the board, good businessmen with good hearts, made fiscally responsible decisions on some aesthetic matters that aroused the ire of the artistically minded women of the church. In another church, the battle over the color of the carpet in the women's lounge caused several families to actually leave. The source of such conflicts may be as simple as was stated by one combatant. If this church is being built with my money, then I'm going to have a say in how it is built. Danger looms when such a cantankerous spirit presents itself, and the damage can be significant. Moses had lots of challenges in dealing with a fickle people, but dealing with a building committee was not one of them. God himself decided the sizes, shapes, colors, and materials of the tabernacle's architecture and furnishings. As for the building fund, the Egyptians had made a major contribution. Whether we are building a church building or the body of Christ, the continuous challenge is to keep our focus on what the divine architect, the master builder, would have us to do. That's really the only way to keep our personal preferences in check. We now come to verse 34. Cloud and glory. Presence at the tabernacle. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Although God is everywhere, he chooses to dwell among his people in a tent in a special way. No tent or temple can contain the Creator God, of course, but the purpose of the tabernacle is to have a symbol of God's presence. So after Moses sets up the tabernacle and consecrates it with oil, God manifests himself in a cloud that envelopes the tent, and thus his glory fills the tabernacle. God's divine presence is in the midst of his people, and his people can see it. The parallel between this scene and and the cloud and glory of Mount Sinai should encourage the people. God now moves the manifestation of his presence from Sinai to be with them 
on their journey. This idea will develop more fully as time passes. We can now come to verse 38. Cloud and fire. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. And the fire and cloud hovering over the tabernacle, the Israelites had a visible, awe-inspiring symbol of God's presence in their midst. No one can deny it. All they can do is follow it. <coughs> Excuse me. God is on a journey with his people, and his people with him. What do you think? What do you think? What visual age have you found to be helpful reminders that Jesus is leading you on your journey? Do you have any artwork displayed around your home, such as uh, a, pic a painting of the Last Supper, perhaps a cross or a crucifix hanging on the wall? What about the seasonal displays in your home? We're coming up on Christmas here, and one of the ornaments I put on my Christmas tree is a nail to remind me that the reason for this season is that Jesus died on the cross for me and then rose again three days later to life. And that's why I put a nail on my Christmas tree. That's just a reminder, and it keeps me in check. It keeps me my mind and spirit focused on Jesus throughout the holidays, not on the glitter and tinsel, not on the secular stuff that goes on, but totally focused on Christ. And what about the elements of the Lord's Supper? Think about it. Sin in the Garden of Eden resulted in humanity's losing the privilege of living in God's presence. But God has acted to reverse that situation. Freed from Egyptian bondage, Israel had God's presence in her midst by means of the tabernacle. Instead of cherubims turning away God's children by means of a sharp sword to guard the way to the tree of life, the Israelites had images of cherubims marking the place of God's presence. Perhaps the candlestick stood for the tree of life as it illuminated the holy place. The manifestation of God's presence was experienced anew when Solomon dedicated the temple. That temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. because of sin. Rebuilt by the returned exiles, the temple was later enhanced by Herod the Great. Standing in his courts, Jesus declared himself to be the true temple. The Apostle John declared, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt literally means tabernacled. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That was Jesus. God made his presence known again on the day of Pentecost. The result was the new temple described in 2 Corinthians 6.16. Christ is the eternal high priest and the perfect sacrifice in an everlasting tabernacle. Today, all Christians have access to the most holy place. In the new Jerusalem, there will be no temple, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. That's Revelation 21:22. Our future is to live in God's immediate presence forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us realize your presence as we worship. May we ever see our body of believers as your dwelling place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Recognize and value God's presence in your life. Stay safe. Be blessed. And stay in the Word.